Welcome back to the Faith Forward Podcast. John Ackerman, Brian Bales. That's right. Uh, it's the beginning of March. It's the beginning of Lent. It's mm-hmm. the beginning of a new series. we got all kinds of new things happening here. We do, but uh, watcher warning, you know, because a lot of times people just listen to us on podcasts. We love that, but many people, yeah. you catch us out on the Church YouTube channel. Uh, that's great, or whatever it might be. For those of you uh, looking at our faces, just a, a little bit of a disclaimer today. Uh, John is not unhappy uh, that I'm aware of. John is also, if in the midst of this, he gives me a look that I said something stupid. I might have said something stupid, but that's not his heart because uh, he would usually hide that look on there. Sure. Uh, but struggling sure. with some back pain today. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but, you know, we serve a God who's able to heal. And so at minimum, we're, we're open uh, that uh, we're going to see something. Maybe you'll watch something pretty amazing happen. Who knows? But uh, that'd be cool. That'd move the faith forward a little bit, right? Seriously, absolutely. Yeah, we just cut the rest of it from that. That's right. Point. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so we are in the beginning of this new series, and I'll let you talk a little bit about that because the, yeah. the invitation again is always watch the Sunday service and then use this as the follow up direct application life application. Um, but again, we know that always that doesn't always happen, mm-hmm. and sometimes the order gets reversed. So give people a little yeah. preview. This Sunday was the beginning of a three-week series on a two-chapter book uh, called Haggai. And I said on Sunday, Haggai, what? A lot of people don't necessarily mm-hmm. know much about that book. It's the third book from the end of the Old Testament, and it's set in what's known as the post-exilic period of the Israelites. Blah, 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 blah. Big words. Right, but it just means this, is that around 586 BC, the southern kingdom called Judah got overthrown by the Babylonians. And if you remember the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all of the people got taken out of Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed, the place of God's focus in the Old Testament about where people worshiped. Uh, Fast forward 50 years after that, 536 BC, Babylon was not the world power anymore. And the new world power allowed a remnant of the Jewish people who were in the Babylonian area to go back to Jerusalem, and about 50,000 of them do. And their main goal when they went back was to rebuild the city, rebuild the walls, rebuild their lives, but more importantly, to rebuild the temple. And what you discover is, is that when we pick up the book of Haggai, it's 16 years after they've moved back. And in that 16 years, uh, what had happened is they've drifted a little bit. And we've talked about this in our series already in other areas that no one drifts towards godliness. We just don't. We drift away from godliness very easily. And intentionally or unintentionally, they started off really well in rebuilding the temple when they went back, but they stopped. And now it's kind of sat that way for 16 years. And so Haggai comes on the scene and this series is called Consider, and it comes from this idea that there are five times in the book of Haggai, um, the prophet says to the people listening, consider your ways, or reflect upon how you're living is another way to say it. How are you doing this? And he, he invites them into understanding the decisions that they've made and what God wants to do for them and why things aren't going the way that they think, and calls them to obedience. And so that's really kind of the first week setting a lot of that context, what he's calling it to. And then what we're asking ourselves in this is to have the Holy Spirit through uh, his invitation in our lives to show us as we consider our ways, you know, how is our spirit? Um, have we been delaying, right, under the idea of obedience and this idea that I was taught a long time ago, which is true, that delayed obedience is not really obedience. Right. You know, the, I'll get around to it. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of us know what it's like, especially maybe these last two years of COVID. Mm-hmm. To things to start slip a little bit, and there are things that we know that God wants and calls us to be doing. We're like, I'll get around to it. Mm-hmm. Gonna, and some of the things that are happening right here in the book of Haggai, they're not bad things. We're going to talk about that, but they're just not the best thing. Right. And so that, that's a little bit of our context when we're diving in. Yeah. And so I'm sure you can imagine that there's absolutely no place in here where we could find any life application for ourselves. So this yeah, none of us have ever delayed at all, right? <laughs> yeah. So this is obviously not a new thing. Right, the, this idea of the drift, this idea of feeling stalled, of feeling stuck, of the things that that I know I should be doing, or the thing, you know, and even there, the temptation with that phrase is to like, all right, let's stomp on the gas and spin the tires mm-hmm. and create some sense of movement. And so, this is not an invitation to extremely overcorrect. Right, right. This is an invitation to, as as we always try to keep our focus here on this platform is an invitation to return to walking with God. His invitation, his direction, his speed. This isn't about now making up for lost time. 
because God's expectation, you know, through the prophet Haggai to the people was not, this should have been built yesterday. And so you need to drop everything and I don't care what it costs. I don't care mm -hmm. the sacrifice. I want this done ASAP, right? This is not God as ticked off CEO. Mm -hmm. This is God inviting his children to come back into relationship and do the thing that's actually in their best interest. Right. Yeah, which is, we'll talk about this in, in a moment, but I think a lot of times when we find ourselves delaying our obedience, which isn't obedience at all, like we've heard from God, right? And and I've said this many times, I'm sure I've said on this podcast, that if we summarize the whole of the Christian life, for me, it's just three words, listen to, obey, rest. Listen to God, obey what God has to say, and rest in the ad obedience. And the rest is a lot for me because sometimes I obey and then I don't like how it's turning out and I want to be in control again. Right. But again, none of us know what that's like, I'm sure. But, you know, he talks about this, about in his grace, when there are things he's called and asked us to do that we are not doing for one reason or the other, many times the very things we're looking to gather or to gain in that delay, like they were, he won't let happen. Mm -hmm. Not because he dislikes us, not because he doesn't love us, not because he's out there with the God with the big stick trying to beat his children, right. but because actually it's a, an aspect of his grace. And we'll, we'll focus a little bit more on that. So if you've ever found yourself in that place where you feel like, well, God is punishing me, punishing me, punishing me, punishing me. We want to invite you to possibly reconsider that thought process in regards to what is true about how God works with you. Yeah. So we're going to start with probably the easiest point to access in our own stories with this as we're contextualizing this part of the Old Testament mm -hmm. is I'll get around to it is not a new thing. <laughs> no, it's not. Right. And, and not just for our daily living, but in our spiritual life as well. And so the, the first thing that I think we wanted to touch on was that, again, this is not God as the overbearing CEO who expects mm -hmm. you to sacrifice everything else in your life to get the job done. But it's that, first off, God doesn't expect us to pretend like there aren't challenges, mm -hmm. that there aren't problems, that there aren't obstacles, that there aren't barriers. Yeah, it, it's, not, it's not that we're supposed to live in this you know, state of denial where everything's supposed to be easy, and if it's not... I'm just supposed to power through. I mean, I'm sitting here with back pain and I'm not trying to keep a happy look on my face because I'm supposed to pretend it doesn't exist. Right. But God's invitation is that in the midst of the challenges, in the midst of the difficulties, in the midst of the pain, that he's there and we get to do things with him. Yeah, he says that actually several times in the book of Haggai, that his the place of comfort, the place of reassurance in the delay or what we'll talk about in next week in the discouragement is I'm with you. And, and I think that's really key because for many of us, I'll speak for myself for sure, is that what we see happens many times, we start out, maybe you've started out on this faith forward journey. Maybe you've started out, as we've been talking about here at Christian Fellowship Church, of saying, I want a transformational relationship with God, not a transactional one. But then as we start, things are much more challenging. And so we put it on pause, yeah. right? And and notice I said pause because I rarely in my life, and I, maybe there's a time, I just can't access it right now in my memory, that I've ever actually told myself I'm going to quit. Right. I've always said I'm going to pause. And one of the things I was trying to talk about on Sunday was that too often what happens when we hit pause and we get distracted with other things, it turns into delay. And that delay goes a whole lot longer mm -hmm. uh, than, than what we thought. Yeah. So it is that sort of invitation that he is calling us to. And he was, again, really key, calling him. And, and catch it, they were excited. So these people didn't have to go back to Jerusalem. Right? I really want us to hear that. So because it'd be really easy to now look back several thousand years ago. Oh, I can't believe they did this, or I can't believe they did this, or I can't believe they did this. They could have stayed where they were. Mm -hmm. They chose to go back. They chose to do these things. So their intent at the beginning was not only good, but divine. Yeah. It, was, it was a wonderful thing. And I think a lot of us know what that's like um, to start off with good intent and maybe start off well, because they did. They, la they laid the foundation. It wasn't like they just went back and didn't do anything. Right. They started this process but it was a whole lot more challenging than maybe they could have even imagined. And that's a lot of the same way about us in our, in our spiritual transformation. Uh, oh, I'm excited about this. Maybe you've been excited about it. And then you start the process and God starts moving some things around in your life. Yeah. And then it gets uncomfortable and it's not nearly as um, pleasant, maybe mm -hmm. is the term I'm looking for, or easy yeah. uh, in some of those ways. And so he doesn't want us to pretend. And again... 
he doesn't, you know, in that particular context, they had challenges both getting resources and, uh, by the way, I didn't mention this, but if you go to the book of Ezra and you go to the book of Nehemiah, those are parallel books mm -hmm. to Haggai. And it gives a lot of background that Haggai doesn't give, specifically Ezra chapter 1 to chapter 4 gives a lot of background to this. And in Nehemiah, you find out about guys with really weird names like Sanballat and Tobiah. I don't know why they name their kids that way, uh, who are actively fighting against this. So it's not even just like you've got other things that are happening because of nature. You've got people actively fighting against this. And so I think some of us know what this is like. We've got those things that happen in our environment that we can't control. Mm -hmm. But then we have those people inside of our environment that we can't control either who are actively fighting against this. So they had legitimate reasons. But in the midst of it, even when it's hard, he wants us to choose, and we can choose and have confidence because he is with us, and 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 we'll talk about this in a moment. It's what's best for us. Yeah. yeah. And so you know, maybe just by beginning, there, there's a kind invitation from God to consider where we are, mm -hmm. to consider what has been getting in the way, and not in a way that invites immediate dismissal of, you know, you shouldn't be having a problem with that, you know, push that to the side, power through, but just the recognition that there are legitimate challenges, right? Like you were saying, there were issues of survival. There were issues of economic resource availability mm -hmm. and there were relational issues. Right? And none of those were small. All of those mattered. And part of God's invitation was invite me into that process, mm -hmm. right? And we'll work through how to deal with your day-to-day -day needs, the availability of materials to rebuild this temple and dealing with the people around you, yeah. right? Again, it wasn't just hop to and build this thing, whatever it takes. And so part of the invitation is now in this moment, just, just pause and allow yourself to catalog the challenges that you feel like are legitimately confronting you today. Yeah, and when we think about this, there's some, a framework that I kind of use for me. He's not calling us to live in denial of our situation. Mm -hmm. He's calling us to come to him for deliverance of our situation, mm -hmm. right? And I think it can really easy be, we're the type of people that like that we think that God's asking us to deny the reality. Yeah. He's not, because denying that reality doesn't change it, mm -hmm. and it certainly doesn't give God that opportunity to transform us. Right. Because it just stays there. And so, I think that's a great. You know, where are you? What are these things? And then, you know, when we get an understanding of that, I think it's this mm -hmm. question I was asking: like, where is God inviting you? To, what is God inviting you to do with Him? I asked this question on Sunday, like if Haggai showed up on the scene of my life, mm -hmm. if, if Haggai showed up in the scene of our church, uh, here at Christian Fellowship Church or whatever church you might be attending if you're watching this, what would he have to say? Mm -hmm. Like uh, if he spoke into that, right, would it reveal that we're going to God for deliverance or would we be people on delay? Mm -hmm. Like would he say that we are passionate towards moving that or... I want to be careful using this word, but complacent doesn't always mean apathy. Like you don't mm, care, mm -hmm. right? I really want to say complacent doesn't mean you don't care. It just means you care about other things more. Yeah. Right. I mean, there are things like apathy is like, you just don't care. Yeah. And, and I don't think any of these people specifically, as I look at it, were thinking to themselves, you know what? Hey, I'm just going to disrespect God. Yeah. Or like, I just really, God doesn't matter. There's nothing about the fact that they would have moved mm -hmm. back there. And I don't think a lot of us that time. And so if you hear us saying this somehow that, oh, that you don't care about God or those sort of things, right. that's not our intent. And that's not the voice of God in your life. That's the enemy for sure. Yeah. And um, so it's, it's not this idea that you don't care about God. Mm -hmm. It's this idea of what has happened in a moment or 16 years here right. or two years, you know, because we're coming up on somewhat... Uh, an, an interesting anniversary of COVID, yeah. right, in March. Um, what has happened to change where we mm -hmm. focus? What is most important in our life? And um, God is inviting to do things, right? Because you, you make this note here, and uh, I, I love it. John is always great at helping me reframe my language in a way that seems more invitational than expectational. I also learned that from I him. I really should have trademarked that. You should have, because I even <laughs> used it last night and looked at you when I used it. Um, but it, he invites us primarily, say, about connection and collaboration, and then it's completion. Flesh that out, because I think us task-oriented people, and I think you've been saying this already, but just nail it down, mm -hmm. it isn't about doing the job yeah. as much as about doing the job with him. 
Would that be a fair way to say it? Yeah. I mean, it really wasn't about the temple at the end of the day. Right? It was. I mean, that was the dwelling place of God with his people. And so there was a necessity to it. Yeah. There was an incredible value to it. This wasn't just moving a pile of rocks from one place to another to yeah. you know, keep people disciplined. But God didn't need the temple to be in relationship with his people. Right. And his people didn't need the temple to be in relationship with him. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it feels like so often... Um, so I'm just, I'm going to jump all over my notes here. I was going to save this for the end, but have you seen the movie Annie, right? The musical, right? Little Orphan Annie, mm-hmm. right? Annie grows up with this hard life, hard knock life. Yeah, yeah, definitely see it. it. You yeah. have to, I, I could. Um, and it is completely understandable why she views the world the way that she does and why she views herself the way that she right. does, right? Her environment has told her the truth of who she is, right? It's told her her value, it's told her her place. And then this amazing day comes where this man adopts her into his home, right? Daddy Warbucks. And the first day arrives where she's brought into his house, this gargantuan house. And, you know, the the butler opens the door and they bring her in and and they ask her the question, what do you want to do first? And her answer is so revealing. It's obviously scripted, but it deeply resonates with me and it deeply resonates with a lot of people that I know that have undertaken this journey with God. Because her response, when they ask her that question, so what would you like to do first? Is she comes in with everything that life has ever taught her, and she looks at this amazing house from the perspective of someone whose job it is to clean it. Mm -hmm. And so she says, well, I guess, and I'm going to get this part wrong, but I guess I'll start with whatever it is, the windows and then the Mm -hmm. drapes, and then I'll do the floor, because if I just bring everything down, you know, then I won't mess up the floor once I've got it right. She's coming into this home that she's been adopted into with a servant's mentality. Yeah. Right? And it's just, it's so revealing when we begin to turn that lens around and, and examine our own heart level relationship with God of just how often we really do think, even though the scriptures directly contradict it, that God wants us to do stuff for him, that he mm-hmm. expects us to perform for him, that he brought us into his house so that we could clean the windows and mop the floors. Yeah, and I think in, in the context here, what you were tying those two together is that Building the temple was the expression of their heart to God, yeah. right? He was getting at the fact that because the temple was laying there in rubble, mm-hmm. right? It's not that God didn't exist everywhere. I mean, there was a lot of Old Testament theology and symbolism around the temple. We're not denying that. Mm-hmm. I talked a little bit on Sunday. But it, it, was, it was revealing their heart. And what it was revealing in that particular case, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit, is a me before God. Now, when I say me before God, certainly there are times where me before God is just a flat out, all the negative, selfish things you can attach to that. But there's also, and we'll talk about this since we've jumped ahead a little bit, this idea a lot of times the me before God comes before a scarcity mentality. And I know we're going to define that a little bit. But, you know, this idea when you started talking about identity, she saw herself not as an adopted person. She saw herself, Annie did, as an orphan. And so that meant the whole way that she looked at everything was through that lens. And we, as followers of Jesus Christ, when we accepted into the family of God, have been adopted, as it says in Romans chapter 8. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are sons in God, sons of God or daughters of God, prince and princesses, right? And in that way, our mentality Many times, though, even though the truth of our identity is there, our mentality still functions like an orphan, like resources are scarce or love is scarce. Mm -hmm. And if I don't do all these things that the world has told me that I have to do first, even though God says to do this first, I'm going to be left out on the own. Yeah. So when we get into that a little bit, you know, we're going to just go all over the place. We're definitely going to spaghetti this conversation instead of waffle it in some ways. Um. But it's not about that. And so please don't hear when we ask, you know, what is God calling you to do and asking you to do? You could hear that from God. And the first thing you do is walk away saying this, that God loves me more if I do this than if I don't do this. That isn't true. God loves you. He knew what you've done, what you are doing, what you're going to do, and still sent Jesus to die for you. He knows everything right now, right? If you're watching this, right, and you've got it up on the internet and there's another tab up on your internet that maybe shouldn't be up, he knows that. 
but it doesn't change his love for you. Yeah. Not at all. Um, and, and so in that, this idea, again, is not about taking our faith forward, stop being complacent, and start doing. It is really about what Haggai is pointing into their spirit and saying, what has happened in you that you move from this place, as we would say in the New Testament, where you're seeking first God's kingdom, where you're going towards he's asked you to do, but now you have to, or you're living in such a way that says, I have to take care of my kingdom because if I don't take care of my kingdom first, all these other things, Matthew chapter six, he talks about, you know, birds have a place to lay, takes care of the lilies, the grass, the field, the lilies, all of that. And that's just, you know, really good poetic language Jesus is using there to talk about whatever it is, you know, that we have in our daily lives that we say these things that we need. He says, yeah, I take care of all these other things. I'm going to take care of you as a son or a daughter. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think there's this moment, though, um, when we were just talking a little bit ago, is that so I'll go back to Matthew chapter Mm 6, where it says, seek first his kingdom. Right. And so I I want to uh, go back to the invitation versus expectation um, idea. So when we read Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, and it says, seek first his kingdom. Right? and all these things will be added to you, it attaches a little bit to back to Haggai because their focus was, here are all these things, because God says this through Haggai, is it time for you to build paneled houses and not build the temple? Mm-hmm. Is it time for you to focus on these things and not my house? And there's a whole lot right. of debate around paneled mm-hmm. houses in verse four, if it was like you were using the lumber for really, really fancy stuff, mm-hmm. Or if it was just, it wasn't time for you to build a house, right? And just right. Ke- keep adding on to it, paint the kitchen cabinets, whatever you do, right? Uh, there's some debate about that. But he was just, he was drawing out the point, like it's been 16 years, mm-hmm. right? It, it's been 16 years. And the thing was, they kept saying, oh, we'll get to it. Yeah. So they weren't actually, they were living in denial, right? But it didn't mean that they knew that they were lying, right? right? They're like, oh, we'll get to it. We'll get right. it. And I think we've all had that. And you know, uh, my storage room. We've been there 10 years in June. Mm -hmm. I've been getting to it for 10 years, right? Um, So this idea we see play out, right? Seek first his kingdom and all these things will add to you. It is an invitation, but it's also a command. And here's what I mean by that. There is no other way to obtain the life that God wants for us outside of seeking first his kingdom. It doesn't work any other way. We can't seek first our kingdom and then go seek his kingdom and get the life to the full that he promised. He says, seek first his kingdom and all these things will be added to you. So it, it is, what it's saying is if you think of the old test that maybe we should, we were used to take, or if you're a particular age, we're still taking tests, you know, they would go, you know, they give you the question, A, B, C, D, all the above. A, seek first his kingdom. There's no B, there's no C, and there's no D, all of the above. Mm-hmm. It has to come here. So it's a command. It is a, it is a, a rule, maybe? Natural law. Term? A natural law. <laughs> yeah, that's a great term. That's all. We will not experience the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. The things that we say that we want, right? Because we say that we want, say, money, for example. Most people don't want money. They want peace. They just express it through money. They want hope or they express it through money. You know, those things. He's going to give all of those things, but the only way to get them is not through all those other things. And so actively what happened was in Haggai, he says this in that section in his verse is like, he loved them enough. Like when they started building their houses and when they started doing all this sort of stuff because they were taking care of their own kingdom mm-hmm. to not let their kingdom grow. Yeah. Like he didn't leave them desperate and desolate and they weren't starving to death, but they weren't having any of the blessings they thought they were supposed to have by moving there. And I think one of the questions that we may want to consider when we look at our lives, not only what is God inviting us to, when we analyze our life and we say where we put our focus, has have we been receiving the blessing that we thought we should be receiving moving in this direction? And the answer is no. There's a good chance, good chance, that it looks a lot like in Haggai where he said, you know, you've been putting money into a purse with a hole in the bottom. So you work, you do all these things, you think this is going to happen, it just flows out and you have to keep. And I think a lot of people, myself included, would call that the hamster wheel. Yeah. Right, uh, and there's not any peace in the hamster wheel. Um, so it's this idea, though, that we have to be willing to take this step of faith—no pun intended, right? Because I think that's really hard. Certainly, in principle, if we've certainly never experienced it, even 
sometimes when we've experienced it, the next one seems next level hard right. to step forward in that. But you made this note that you know you will you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What what does that mean? Yeah, I think when we think about you know first seek ye first the kingdom because when you say it in the King James, it's even more it sounds very powerful. Yes, right. Yes, um, but there's this idea of all right. Well, that means I need to do all my church things first. Right. We, even with this, we try to become task focused. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, all right, well, then I'm going to I'm going to read my Bible first in the morning. I'm going to make sure that I don't miss a Sunday service or the Sunday podcast or you know whatever. Yeah. And and then these other things will be added to me. And again, it's an invitation back to connection. You know, Jesus says in John eight, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And there again, we, we turn that into task completion and knowledge acquisition. Mm-hmm. Right. If I learn the right things, if I learn the truth then I'll get the things that I want, right? It's, again, transactional approach to a relationship with God, right? Yeah. God tells me the rules, I follow the rules, I get what I want, and I sort of have control over the outcome. And I heard somebody retranslate this verse for me, and we've talked before about you know, this word no is, is really special to us here at Christian Fellowship Church. It's in our mission statement, yeah. right? Discipling people to know Jesus as Lord. And again, it's not academic knowledge. Mm-hmm. It's an experiential reality, right? To experience Jesus as Lord. And if you're hearing this for the very first time, great. But we, I just want to add, hop into that, that. That word no is a biblical word. You're like, oh, you're taking that word out of context. No, that's what is always meant in Scripture. Yeah. Nowhere in Scripture will you find the word when there's called to know something that it means just head knowledge. Yeah. Because for a Jewish person, there was no separation. For an Eastern culture, which this Bible was written to, there is no separation between the idea of head knowledge and actually experiential knowledge. They have to be walked out. So, all right, unpause. Yeah. So you will know the truth is actually you will experience yeah. the truth. And so there again, we still want to we still want to make this transactional somehow. Mm-hmm. So, all right, I'll experience right thinking, right believing. I'll, I'll show up to a church that teaches me the right things. I'll live the right things and I'll get what I want. And I heard somebody who was explaining this verse to me say that that word truth is actually better translated reality. Mm -hmm. And so you will know the truth. Effectively, what Jesus is saying is you will experience reality. You will experience the reality of the kingdom. You will experience the reality of a true connected relationship to God. That will set you free. Not your performance. Right. Because once you actually experience reality, it changes us. It does. It, it, it changes us. I wish I could think of a really good <clears throat> illustration of this right now off the top of my head, but I really just can't. But, I mean, there's just moments I know in all of our life that, like, we thought something worked a particular way, and then all of a sudden, you're like, why am I ever going to go back to that other way of doing it? So, I got one. So, and it very much models this story that Haggai is telling us. Right? When I first discovered that there was this level of intimacy available with mm-hmm. God, I mean, it was the classic honeymoon phase, right? Everything was just, you know, we were strolling through meadows and, you know, all that. And then that honeymoon phase, you know, began to mature into a real relationship. And I got busy with life, right? And so all of a sudden, I wasn't giving God that that extended time that I had been giving him, but then also was shocked as to why it felt different. Yeah. And I looked at my calendar and I looked at my days, and this was when I was still teaching high school, and so it was early mornings and late nights and grading papers and still trying to spend time with my wife and time with our friends and, you know, all the obligations that you have. And I finally just had it out with God. And I was like, when, like, I want this, you know, I want this, you know, that I'm all in, but there is just no time. How do I do this? Mm-hmm. And God very kindly said, you're not real busy at four thirty in the morning. And there was this moment of like laughter and oh crap and like oh no all at once. But it was sort of this this mo- this moment of reorientation of showing me the things that I had prioritized and not wrongly because those were all important. Right. But that there was this thing that I kept saying I wanted more. This closeness with God. I kept saying I want this more than anything else. And so God sort of opened my eyes to Hey, there's a block of time there. And then I went through, but God, I'm going to be so tired. I'm not going to have anything to give at school. I'm just, you know. Yeah. And God was like, how about you trust me? Like, if I'm inviting you into this, mm-hmm. I'm going to make a way. And so I, I started waking up at 4.30. And I had 
an hour, an hour and a half all of a sudden to spend with God. And it wasn't perfect every day. There were times where I just, I didn't have it and I snoozed and snoozed and snoozed. And, but it was, it was a process that we navigated through. And so after about a week or so, I was, I was exhausted. I was utterly exhausted. And I went back to God after a week of waking up at 4.30 and I was like, dude, this is not sustainable. Yeah. I don't know what you were thinking, but this doesn't work. Can't, and again, here's the trick, right? I don't just stop with God. I know better than you and you must have been wrong, right? It's help. All right. So what did you mean? Did I miss something along the way? And I'll still remember this was 2013, 2014. So, I mean, seven years ago now. Yeah. And I still remember it like it was yesterday. He said, I told you to wake up at 4.30. I didn't tell you to go to bed at 11. And it was like, I was, again, I was struck by how much I was still trying to re- live the rest of my life exactly as I had. Mm-hmm. I was still trying to stay up to watch Sunday night football and Monday night football and Thursday night football. Yeah. I was still trying to stay up on Tuesday nights with my guys group till all hours of the morning because really good things were happening, right? And, and God had to help me learn to set healthy boundaries and he had to teach me what I was at. One of the things he showed me was I don't actually care that much about football and me going to bed at nine 30 and waking up and spending time with God. And then, you know, either turning on ESPN to catch the highlights or reading the summary of the games, which takes five minutes instead of three and a half hours. I was so much happier. Yeah. But it required reprioritizing. I like that. Like that. Now, by the way, completely not related, but as a Browns fan, it's only worth watching highlights. It's not sure. worth watching the whole game. Yeah. But when we think about us taking our, our faith forward, maybe a good thing to do is inventory mm-hmm. where our priorities are. Mm-hmm. You know, I said this Sunday that our priorities tell a story about the priority of God. Mm-hmm. Right? Like if we sit down in inventory, what are our priorities? When you lay them out, where's the priority of God in there? And that's not shaming. It's just, it's there on paper. When we begin to sit and say, "Oh, there it is on paper," the paper's not there to lie to you. Yeah, you know, they don't. The paper doesn't have an agenda. It's mm-hmm. just telling you. And and so a lot of times, especially in Haggai, what happened was they got distracted, not by bad things, yeah. right? It was just the drift. I mean, to, we go back to your house. Like you, you're working on your house, been working on your house for a good long time. They were working on their houses. Yeah, we'd all agree that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Right, they got focused on crops and, and those sort of things, and, and those aren't bad. We get focused on our jobs, all of those things, they are not bad. But what happens over time is those distractions turn into long term delays, yeah. and then they move up the priority list. And you know, my wife and I, uh, we like to spend time, um, and we need to do a better job on this. We've just been talking about this. We like to spend time every day, at least for a period of time, together with God. You know, talking to God, listening to God, and but as of late, He's got the end of our day, mm-hmm. right? And for a while, that worked really, really well. Mm-hmm. But right now, we're exhausted, yeah. right? We're exhausted, and so we're trying to figure out, all right, what do we do? How do we move this around? Because we want to do it together. But if it's a priority, we've got to do it in a way that's different than just when you know we head to bed at night because it doesn't matter whether I head to bed at 9 30 or 10 which is 9 30 is usually like when I'm heading upstairs for me right. I'm still tired at 9 30 it's yeah. not about that it's about what part of my day am I giving him mm-hmm. and I know like my relationship with God is just it's better when I'm not tired yeah. it, it's just better when I'm not tired um and hear from him. so again you know when we're thinking this you know a couple of questions that you may want to ask it, you know, where's your priorities and put that, but what's God inviting you to do with him, mm-hmm. right? Because again, when he was talking about rebuilding this temple, yes, they were doing the manual labor, but it was really key that he said over and over that I am with you. Now, I won't take a whole lot of time to talk about theology, right? But in the Old Testament, when he says, I am with you, right? That is something that is unique and special, It's still very unique in the New Testament that he's with us, but we know we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us all the time. It's a given. In the Old Testament, that's not how God interacted with his people in the same way. And so when you hear the words, I am with you, I mean, he loved you and he was that, but when you're, I am with you, that's like, hey, I'm inviting you into this. And so what is he asking for us to do with him, right? We may have to bring out the hammer or we may have to bring out whatever they used back in the day to do what he's asking. But we're not doing it alone. Right. Yeah. 
yeah, there's an invitation to do all of this with God. Mm-hmm. And so you're talking about me working on my house. And again, I so resonate w- with this section of the scriptures because it feels like my life. Like I have a home to renovate mm-hmm. and I have work here at the church to do. And I have, you know, groups that I lead here and there. Like we have a podcast. Yeah, right? yeah. There, there is stuff to do. Yeah. And if I'm feeling like these are things that God wants me to do and it's up to me to get it done, I so quickly feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it starts to feel like God is just mean. God, how could you put this much on one person? How could you give me a whole house to renovate on my own that I can't afford to outsource? And how could you give me all of these people that need need you Mm -hmm. and need somebody to talk to? And how could you give me all these... Right, God, you're just, you're mean. You're trying to kill me. Can I pause here for a moment? I just want to say publicly, I appreciate your vulnerability on that because there's a whole lot of people listening may think, oh, man, he said that out loud. But here's the key. God already knows what we're thinking. When we say things out loud, it's confession, Mm -hmm. right? It's not information. We're not informing God of how we feel. It's that first step in starting to allow him to begin to show us what's true about what we're feeling, Right. The feeling of overwhelmed is very real, but God being mean, that's not, that's not real, right? But the overwhelmed is real. And I think a lot of people right now may be thinking, oh man, I'm overwhelmed. And now God's just going to add one more thing to our plate, right? That if God is inviting you into something, he is with you and meanness is not part of that process. So he's teaching us stuff about how to deal with things that are overwhelming, how to do both or all or separate or whatever it might be in that case, Right. right? Yeah, his invitation to me lately has been very similar to the invitation from seven, eight years ago. Of, you know, God, how do I spend my time with you? Here, let me show you. And then let's navigate that. You know, lately, and this is yesterday, um, you know, it's, it's been the encouragement to invite me into your to-do list for the day and let's talk about it before you dive headlong into it. Mm-hmm. Right? Because there's, there's the mission critical things, there's the tyranny of the urgent, but then there's also the things that are just really worth investing in, right? Yeah. Which was the problem with the temple. The temple yeah. was really worth investing in, but it fell victim to the tyranny of the urgent. Yeah. And and so lately my conversation with God has been, help me to see what's for today. Mm-hmm. And like Jesus said, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Yeah. And, and making that practical, making that an interactive conversation where I'm no longer putting the pressure on myself to do all the things that I think I should be doing. Or all the big picture invitations that God has given. God doesn't expect me to finish my house by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Right? And he doesn't expect me to get all of the work here done tomorrow. But he does have an invitation for me today. And sometimes that invitation is to look at all those things. And then God says, you choose. I trust your judgment. Right? This isn't always about following the general's orders. And you know, right? This is a collaborative relationship. But there are times where God just, well, not times. God always sees the picture more clearly than Mm -hmm. we do. And so sometimes, just like Annie getting invited into Daddy Warbuck's house, it's a reframing of our fundamental lens that we see the world through, that we see ourselves through, and we see God through, of she just got invited into this incredible home with all of these resources available to her, and her only lens is through the lens of work. Yeah. Which and is, she, she has things to do there. Mm-hmm. It's not to be a servant, but like she gets to be a collaborative part of what's happening there. Yeah. But there's some reframing that first has to happen of, you know, my dear, you're you're not here to clean the house. You're here as a daughter. So that reframing is what we referred to earlier on and as we kind of get our way to the end of scarcity yeah. mindset. Um, and we talked about this a little in advance. I, I was pretty sure I knew what you were talking about because we, we speak a lot of the same language, some different, but a lot of the same. Um, what does that, I mean, when people hear scarcity, mm-hmm. it's not, it's this idea, right, that doesn't really understand our position. And because we don't understand our position, our expectations of God fall short than what he can and wants to do. We have a scarcity mentality, less than yeah. uh, in that way. How does, so you mentioned the orphan mentality. So we see ourselves as servants instead of sons and daughters, right, right. Uh, that he wants to serve. Um, this other aspect, I think, though, that you mentioned earlier on about maybe God's just not interested in me, mm-hmm. right? And so maybe that's not a servant. Maybe you still say, I'm a son, but I'm the son he doesn't care about, right. or I'm the daughter he doesn't care about. Um, that's not how it works with him though, right? No, not at all. But if we see ourselves as a servant, then it's easy to believe that God is the servant owner mm-hmm. 
who, as long as we're performing, doesn't see us. And so like you've talked about so many times that God only shows up when we mess up. Yeah. Right. And, and so there's, you know, the idea of scarcity that there's, there's only so much, right. It's one of the fundamental concepts of economics, which I used to teach my kids, right. There's this pool of resources and that's all there is. And whether it's time or whether it's raw materials or whatever, this is all there is. And God just doesn't function that way. Mm -hmm. Right. He's outside of time and he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Plus who knows how many other Wegmans. Yeah. And scarcity isn't the problem and he never looks through a lens of scarcity and he never looks through a lens of i need you to do stuff for me or i'm going to be mad at you it's always through the lens of invitation it's always through the lens of connection and collaboration right it's always through the lens of i have things that i want to show you i have things that i have prepared for you well in advance yeah. that will teach you the truth about who you are who you actually are which isn't a servant you're my son Right? It's, the, it's the parable of the two sons and the loving father, right? The one who seemingly threw it all away to go do what he wanted, but the other one who was working himself to the bone out of a belief that that's who his father was and what his father wanted from him. Both of them had the scarcity mentality, right? The, the older brother, right, that working, the younger brother, I'm a servant now, yeah. right? That I've lost my position because of my failure to perform like I should as a son. Yeah. Yeah, the one, I won't get what I want unless I take it. And the other one, I won't get what I want unless I perform. Yep. And it's just, that's that's one of the places that God is most interested in restoring, is the truth of who he says we are and the truth of who he says he is. Yeah. And so again, it's, it's not that he wants us to just ignore and dismiss the challenges. It's that he wants to be invited into them. Yeah. It's not that he wants us to sit around all day and do nothing but listen to worship music. Right? There's things that he's intended us to partner with him on. But he wants to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not that he just wants you to work for him. It's that he wants to show you how much he loves you. And because of that love, all the incredible things that he has prepared for you. Not that that doesn't mean there won't be trouble and there won't be challenges. There won't be back pain. Right? It's not a smooth ride. But it's so much richer when God says, what do you want to do first? If we don't look at tasks and we look at connection. Amen. That's about all I got. Yeah, that's all I got too. <laughs> but again, we invite you, if you have questions or want to interact more, you can uh, email us here, faithforward at cfcwire.org. Uh, whether that's a, hey, I didn't follow that exactly, or a thank you, we get those from time to time. Or could you be a little more practical? And sometimes, you know, to the level of your vulnerability, if you want to say, hey, these are some particular issues, we'd be happy to pray along with you. Notice yeah. we didn't say provide you with the answers, yeah. right? Because he's the only one that provides the answers. But we're happy to pray along with you in that process. And if God gives us any wisdom to share with you, we'd be happy to do that. Yeah. But he's, you know, going back to it, the answer to this isn't ask Brian. I almost pointed to you and said Brian. <laughs> right? Ask Brian or ask John. The answer to this is ask God. Yeah, and he's the one whose spirit is in you to help you refine you to take your faith forward. Yeah. So thanks for being a part of this. We'll see you all next time. Mm -hmm.